Life was so simple. task is mine this morning to speak with you in a, a strange environment that we find ourselves in, in a hybrid environment where we have individuals listening online and also individuals in our midst. Uh, when we thought we were coming out of this pandemic, we also had the challenge of the Ukraine crisis. And these last few years, in my mind, have been a difficult one. 
and has caused us as a church to reflect and think differently about what we do and how we do it. Our task as a church is to be creative and open to change and embrace change and grow. And so as we do this, we pray that not only will your church grow, but indeed you'll find a way of keeping in contact with those contacts that you have online, uh, but also nurturing the individuals that come through your gates. I want to share a little word of comfort to you this morning. I want to encourage you that uh, even in your deepest midnight, we have hope. These moments won't last forever. God will either step in and fix the situation, or indeed he will come back in, with clouds of glory, as we believe. And I hope there will be one or two amens out there from, the, from the, those who believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you have your Bibles with you online or in your devices, would you turn with me to 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. And I'm told that I have less than half an hour to preach to you. Um, so if I stop the sermon suddenly, Pastor can fill it in this evening when he's doing his course. <laughs> the Bible simply says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Would you bow your heads with me as we deal with this passage of scripture under the caption, a living hope, a living hope. Father God, we are indeed grateful that you are our living hope and that you speak with us and to us. Now, Father, just use me as a simple channel of your blessing so that someone else might find you and find hope is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a lonely, anxious, confused world. A world pictured by hopelessness, sorrow, and pain. A world of enforced restrictions on movement, a world characterized by fear, crisis, and loss. A world where all some people see are never-ending days of hopelessness, suppression, fear. A world of forced historical enlightenment. Uh, and perhaps a catastrophic resistance to Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, in which he proclaimed, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by God, by their creator, <laughs> with certain unenable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, our world is similar to the time when the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter wrote. He wrote that letter to those who were struggling in Asia Minor, modern Turkey. He wrote his beleaguered, frightened, persecuted members who were facing difficult times. Uh, they were scattered across Asia Minor. Uh, they needed the reassurance that God was with them. They felt the 
imprint of the knee of Nero as he pushed his knee on their necks. He wrote, trying to give comfort to those who go through moments of comfort where they feel no one else really cares. And he wanted to remind them that even though they have seen the loss of their loved ones, even though they have experienced the pain of hurt, even though this moment is like nothing they've ever seen before, they still have a living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls his believers in 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, pilgrims, sojourners, indicating their temporary residence. He wanted to let them know that they are living their lives away from the support of the Jerusalem Christians. In a real sense, these asylum seekers, these refugees, if you please, uh, they were spiritual sojourners, just as so many of the Ukrainians are today, just as so many of the Russians are today, just as so many of us are today. You see, Peter was trying to alert his broken believers, and we who read these pages of sacred scripture, that this world is not really enough. The things of this world can never really satisfy. This world is not really our home. We are just passing through this world on our way to an eternal home. We need to learn lessons and experience the joy of journeying together towards the kingdom of God. Uh, look at the person sitting next to you. Would you do that for me? I see some people struggling to look at the people next to them. Uh, could, you, could, you, could you look at them and realize, hey, uh, they along with you are journeying to a better place. Amen. Now, some of you looking at the people next to you and you're saying to, to me, hey, hey, some of these people aren't really going to get there. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, they are not perfect. But, but guess what? Neither are you. But somehow we embody what we believe is a, a, a mirrored image of God. When we look at people beside you, you, you really want to see an individual who has Jesus Christ dwelling inside of them. Okay, I know it's hard for you to say amen. Yeah, I, I know that, I know that, I understand. Uh, it's hard because we're broken. And we might want to judge each other and say, hey, they should not be here. But maybe neither should we. We only stand here by the grace of God. We need to value those who journey on this path with us. Uh, in the midst of a world of filled with crisis, we have proof that we have a living hope sitting right beside you. In the midst of this war, in the midst of loneliness, in the midst of pain, in the midst of the doctor's prognosis, in the midst of social isolation, we have a living hope. If we have that relationship with Christ that pulls us through this moment. The hope Peter refers to is that eager, confident expectation that the life to come in eternity. Hope in the New Testament is always uh, relates to a future goodness. People are so misguided about hope. People around us put too much hope in every kind of material thing. Uh, they put hope in the stock market, hope in a bank account, hope in cryptocurrency, in, in a job, 
in a person they feel, believe that will, will give them eternal happiness. <laughs> uh, they put hope in their own power. Uh, little do they realize the stock markets will crash. The bank account will run down. The crypto trade, well, it's uh, unpredictable. That job will draw your life resources from you, and then it will sack you. Okay, okay. <laughs> the person that you say that you love, they may leave you. <laughs> your health will fail you. Uh, there are some things that we can we could do when we were uh, in our 20s, Pastor Thomas, when we took on some teams, some giants, and we beat them. Uh, that we can't do now. We can't even run to the nearest possible. <laughs> uh, hope is feeble without the assurance of the living hope in Christ Jesus. You see, amidst this present anxiety, amidst this loneliness, this fear that has been nurtured by the, this invasion this COVID-19, the difficult dangers that we have seen and unseen, that we go through on a regular basis, we are justified in viewing the future with optimism because we are securely attached to the God uh, who made us and paid the price for us and reclaims us and calls us his own. Our living hope comes from a living, resurrected Christ who, who, who has prepared an inheritance, I believe, for all of us. First Peter 1, 3 to 5, tells us that God's people have a living hope because of our new life in Christ, because of our precious inheritance, and because of the security in the power of God's word. God's people have a living hope, the first point, because of the new life in Christ. 1 Peter 1, verse 6, uh, Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice. What are you talking about, Peter? Uh, don't you see the, the inflation that's taking place? Don't you see the oil prices increasing? Don't you see the refugees that are now coming to this country? Don't you see the pains that we are going through? Don't you understand, Peter, that this is a crisis moment in time? What are you talking about? Well, Peter is really referring to verse 3 when he says, God has begotten us again. Oh, come on. Someone should have been shouting there. <laughs> This phrase really is the, the new life we experience through entering into a personal relationship with the man Christ Jesus. You see, God has a habit and a way of putting new life into old things. <laughs> He has a, a way of rescuing those who should be destroyed and putting them in a place where they now can enjoy the salvation that they can only get through what Jesus Christ did for us. You see, he left heaven for us. He emptied himself of God. And he became a man just like you and I. He lived a life in such a way that exemplified how we should live with each other. He, he, he was actually sacrificed on a cross so that each one of us could understand what it took for God to love us. Died in a grave, but was resurrected on Sunday morning. And went to heaven and is now interceding on, us, on our behalf. You see, our hope is not in something that is dead and buried. Our hope is really in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 indicates the means by which God has done this for us. He's begotten us again. We were lost to sin, now we are regained because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. John, in, in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says it better. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Our hope is not really in vain. Our hope is only in the promise of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> we know people who think they, all they have to do is to come to church, pay their tithes, uh, uh, volunteer to, to work at a food kitchen, uh, pro, go to a protest march or, or do something. And they say, hey, uh, that's it, you know. 
Uh, but what we know better than that, and we can rejoice because we have a new life in Jesus Christ. God's people have a living hope because of our new life in Christ. But not only that, God's people have hope because of their precious inheritance. First Peter 1 and verse 4, Peter used the word inheritance to describe the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are born again. We are now no longer the same. We are now brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And we should be living that way on a regular basis. We are all sons and daughters of God. We have an inheritance emphasizing the believer's eternal home in, in heaven. While we do not have the luxury of, of living uh, in an expensive mansion uh, like your pastor does. While, <laughs> while we do not have the luxury of having all the things in this life that we really, really desire, we have the assurance that one day soon we will have a, a place in the heavenly mansions. <laughs> uh, the story is told of... Uh, uh, the misfortune of the Wang family, Nina Wang, uh, the richest woman in Asia, uh, who died of cancer in 2007 at the age of 69. Uh, two years before her death, she signed over her vast uh, fortune to uh, uh, an unknown feng shui master uh, called Tony Chang. Uh, he, he promised her eternal life if she would sign over her fortune to her. Wang changed her will in 2006 in order to have everything in, given to the Feng Shui master, Tony Chang. Avoiding a previous will that was written four years earlier and left everything to her family and her charity. With no children of her own, Wang wrote a new will in 2006, two years after her ovarian cancer was diagnosed making the 48-year-old Tony Chang her sole beneficiary. <laughs> the question is, uh, why would Chang ask Wang to put her, him in her will if he had assured her that she would live forever? <laughs> right. Peter says, our precious inheritance can never perish, never spoil, and never fade. These verbal adjectives indicate that our inheritance is protected. It is not eroded by war. It is untouched by death. It is unstained by evil and unimpaired by time. Our inheritance is swindle-proof, death-proof. Sin proof, self proof, time proof. But Peter assures us that this precious inheritance is kept in heaven for believers. Uh, don't let no one or nothing steal your inheritance. Don't let no sad ventus draw, draw the, the joy out of being an Adventist. <laughs> and suggest to you that Adventism is about some stiff-necked people. Sorry, some, um, yeah, anyway, yeah, let's not go over there. <laughs> Peter wants to assure us that our salvation, our joy is kept in heaven for us. Yeah. Kept means to be guarded or to reserve. Uh, Peter, he, he's trying to convey a picture here of, of the soldiers who stand guard over the crown jewels, beef eaters, if you please. We only guard things that are precious to us. Uh, the tense, these verbs, kept, emphasize the state or condition and underlines the fact that the, our inheritance already exists and is being preserved by God himself. God has reserved our precious inheritance in heaven for believers and it is protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> And it continues to be there, still reserved for us. 
the difficulties, the uncertainties, the anxieties, the trials, the poverty, and the loss of loved ones, our own failing health, wars, even these things cannot destroy the inheritance that God has reserved and kept for us. We have a living hope because of our inheritance. So, so not only do we have a living hope because God's people have a living hope in Christ Jesus. God's people also have a living hope because of our precious inheritance. But can I go a little further? God's people have a living hope because of, of our security in the power of God. First Peter 1 verse 5 the salvation that is ready to be revealed is synonymous to uh, the inheritance described in verse 4. Believers are cared for by God the Father. We are kept, we are shielded by God's power. Shielded means uh, to guard, to keep watch over. <laughs> uh, this military term it really de describes uh, the way how soldiers guard someone. It's like uh, how the bodyguards guard their celebrities, like uh, Riri and uh, Beyonce. Uh, like the president's team would form a guard uh, around them. <laughs> and it gives just the impression <laughs> that God is always constantly shielding his people. Uh, it does not suggest that believers are shielded from the reality of this sin-cursed world. You see, even though God shields us from life, there are some things that break through those shields and affect us. But they never destroy us. There are some things that break through our shield that God has placed around us that, that cause us sometimes to question the very existence of God. God, if you are there, then, then why did these things happen to me? And it's natural for us to react in that way when we realize that there are some things that come to us or some things that we have never enjoyed because we don't have the ones that we love in our lives. There are some situations that we face that we say to ourselves, God, why? I've been faithful to you. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. But yet still, I find myself in this situation at this time. Where is your shield of love that's supposed to be around me? The reality of the God we serve is that he doesn't always take away the issues that we face. He doesn't always supply the needs that we have. He doesn't always do the expected things. But what he does do is suggest to us that despite what we're going through, hey, hey, our hope is not down here. Our hope is up there. And despite what happens to us in this life, we have the assurance of a living hope. <laughs> Listen. struggling believers it doesn't matter who you are what you have done what you have experienced what you need in your life we serve a living hope that still works in the midst of our circumstances I know I have some witnesses here this morning. We may perceive that what we have been through and what we're going through 
that all we are are failures. But, but we serve a God who delights in using what we perceive as failures for his glory. <laughs> you are never outside of the reach of God's love. Stories told of a Finnish army that had uh, fought the Russian soldiers. They had got to a place where they invaded one of the towns in, in Finland and uh, they were pushed back and seven Russian soldiers were, were condemned to die. They were guarded by a few of the Finnish army and as they marched them down and put them in the basement of one of the town halls, they used that as uh, their cell. And through the night, these guards were outside fighting and cussing. Uh, the, the guards inside, the, 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 the Russian guards who were about to die, they didn't want to accept the fact. And sometimes when things happen to us and we don't really want to accept what's going on, we, we use all kinds of things to, to make excuses as to why we do what we do. These men cussed and they punched the walls with their fists they, they, they would have even started fighting each other. They knew they were going to die. And in the midst of that melee, someone started singing this song. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love o'ershaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. Over and over again, this guy called Koshkenen, he, he sang that song until the wild spirit in each of those prisoners had calmed down. And then some crazy guy jumped up and said, what, are you trying to convert us? Are you trying to make us religious? Gus Kenan said, no, no, listen, my friend. I heard that song some weeks ago when I was passing through one of the market towns. And I heard the Salvation Army people sing that song. And it reminded me of the experiences I had when I was a child. My mom used to sing some songs to me. And she uh, used to recite scripture to me. And these memories just kept coming back. And I tried to push them out of the way and, and, and go and do the job that we were asked to do. And, and I couldn't even deal with the people that you asked me to fight. That night I went home and... Uh, I don't know what happened to me, but the, the Spirit of God was there, and it was, he was real to me. He, he was speaking to me. He was challenging the things that I had done in my life, and I felt that I couldn't do anything but give myself to Jesus. Because Kenan said he, in the nighttime, he, he, he was woken up out of his sleep. He saw visions of, of Christ coming back in glory and, and, and Jesus uh, taking him into his breast. He said that he, he could only do uh, what he thought would be the right thing. He fell down on his knees and asked God, God, can you, can you do something with this sinner? Koskinen told the men what God had done for them, how he had changed his life. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and from that day on was he wanted to live a life that would give honor and glory to God. The man that 
shouted at him, said, yeah, but, but, but how can God save me? I've killed people. I've shed innocent blood, destroyed people's lives. What can God do with me? And fell down on his knees and cross and fell down with him. And the two of them hugged each other and prayed. God started moving. People started realizing, hey, there's something different about what's going on now. The people outside who were guarding, the soldiers outside that were guarding these people, they, they themselves started to cry. They themselves were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. They realized that there was something at work here, more than just a war in action, but really the Holy Spirit of God was working even on death row. One after another, they started to talk about the things that they had been through and confessed their sins and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior on death row. There, they started to sing that song and some of them started to write some uh, scriptures and letters to their friends and their families to tell them what they had gone through. And they got to the place where they themselves uh, were exhausted and the time was gone. And they were due to come out and be shot at dawn. They got the uh, guards to march them out into the open field. And they lined them up. Some of them asked to take off the, the, the blindfolds. Some of them asked to have their hands uh, on straps so they could raise them up towards heaven. They asked to sing that song again, safe in the arms of Jesus. And after the words faded out, the lieutenant said, fire. God doesn't always intervene when we want him to the most. He allows us to go through that moment so that we can build faith and trust in him. But we should go through that moment knowing that even if it happens, God is with us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. And I believe there are some folks here this morning who understand exactly what I'm talking about. You, you, your life isn't perfect. You've had some challenges in your experience. And you know... You know that you can't save yourself. But you know a God who can. <laughs> and maybe I'm speaking to someone here who, because of what's going on in your life, you, you just want to make a, a recommitment to the Lord. You, you, you're, you're walking with the Lord. You're enjoying uh, the journey with him. Things are, are, are going well in your life. You don't wrestle with where God has put you and the things that you're going through if you're here and God has blessed you like that hey praise God for you but maybe I'm talking to some people here who have really been broken by life maybe I'm talking to some people here who unless God intervenes in your life some of the things that you really want will never be achieved in this life Am I talking to you, my sister? Am I talking to you, my brother? If that's you, when you're in either of those two categories and you just want to stand this morning in, in rededicating your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, can I ask you to do so now? You're here. You're experiencing some issues in your life. God is working through. Thank you, my sister. God is working through some stuff in your life. Thank you, my sister. God, you're standing saying, hey, God, take my life recommit me to your service help me to be a uh, the kind of person that you want me to be help me to be a giant in Chiswick if that's your desire then stand to your feet maybe I'm talking to another group of people someone here who has not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior from sin someone who's been wrestling with giving themselves to Christ or trying to live an, a life that hasn't really worked out for you. Maybe I'm speaking to you. 
you've heard the words this morning and you say that you want to give yourself in baptism to the Lord. If you're here and God is speaking to your heart that way, then I'm going to ask you just to simply raise your hand. If you're listening online and you know that God is speaking to you this way, then I'm going to ask you to make sure that you contact the elders, respond to the link that you're listening to. Somebody will touch base with you. But if you're here in our midst and you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand wherever you are. Can you do that for me this morning? We're going to sing that song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Uh, We won't be too long this morning. But we don't want the Spirit of God to pass us by. Let's sing it. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass. in the PA room just go to that third verse I know we don't have much time and I probably kept you longer here than you should be Uh, but I believe God is trying to speak to somebody and I'm trying to say to you that hey perhaps you need to trust God even where you can't see him at work in your life I'm speaking to you this morning you feel committed to walk anew with Christ you feel that you need to recommit yourself to him or you want to give yourself in baptism to the Lord then respond to our appeal ask God to give you the courage to trust him even now let's trust him trust in only that we serve a God in whom we have a living hope. God, we are thankful that you speak to us in moments of our distress and you intervene in our lives from time to time to let us understand that you are alive and you're still there. And even in the moments that we can't see you, Father, we're still grateful for the assurance that we have that this place down here is not our end. We are bound for a better place. So God, we thank you. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with those individuals who have made different commitments today. Be with those who want to recommit themselves to you. Be with those who are struggling with issues, but yet they still believe in the joy that you have. 
be with those, Father, who you're speaking to, who are trying to make a decision for you. God, give them no peace tonight. Give them an opportunity, Father, to respond to your love and your joy. Father, even now, walk through our midst. Do your thing through the internet. Touch somebody's life and let them know that you're a God who loves them more than they love themselves. We leave this moment in your hands, Father. And we thank you for the hope that we have found in you. In Jesus' name.